this week, and we're, we're calling it the dimensions of the mystery, you know, the mystery of Christ. So if we'll look at our opening uh, verse we've got here, it's actually, uh, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 3, we'll go to verse 14. We're going to read the verses that we have here. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. And what we see here, I would read the Apostle Paul, you know, talk to the Ephesians. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole failing heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. I need unto the uh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're seeing him do this here. And we've, we've talked about prayer in um, previous studies. Uh, you don't have to bow your knees every time you pray. It's optional. Paul's doing it here. He doesn't do it in other prayers that you find in, say, Colossians 1 or Philippians 4, that type of thing. But nonetheless, he's doing it here. There's nothing wrong with doing it, not doing it, just depending on what it is you're looking to do, um, what it is you're looking to accomplish in your prayer. And this is what Paul does here. This goes, I bow my knees unto uh, the Father, but Lord Jesus Christ is of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And so we see that whole, he's talking about the whole family, the whole you know, kingdom of God. If we look back at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 9, for example, where he says, you know, having made known unto us uh, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. And so you're, he's again talking about the dispensation of the fullness of times, but he mentions those two uh, bodies there. He's talking about the whole family there. In other words, he's saying um, in verse 10, he's talking about all, being, uh, all things being gathered together in one uh, in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. You come into Ephesians chapter 3, and he's saying in verse 15, in, uh, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And so without, you know, discerning or rightly dividing the word of truth, you may think, well, that must be the entire body of Christ. We're going to heaven, we're going to earth, heaven and earth. And so that, that false doctrine comes in where, you know, we go to heaven to be with the Lord, and then we come back down to earth for a thousand years, and then we go back up to heaven again, and then we come back down again. Um, that gets taught quite a bit, unfortunately. And uh, you'll see that there, but actually the heavens belong to the body of Christ, where God's agency for heavenly dominion, and uh, Israel is going to be God's uh, agency for earthly dominion. So we see that in verse uh, 14, I'm sorry, 15, where you're saying the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And this is where this is just the opening of his prayer here in verse uh, 14 and 15 as well. And so he says of the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And so this is just the introductory for his prayer that we're kind of seeing here. But now we're going into, you know, as we go further in our outline, we're seeing that he's going to mention four things in this prayer. And then these four things that he has, you know, a desire for the Ephesians to have, included in these four things is going to be the four dimensions of the mystery. So we're going to see four things. It's going to be like one, two, three, four. And inside, I believe it's number three. Yeah, it's number three. Uh, number three is going to go down into four other parts where you get the breadth and length and depth and height. So this is going to be one of those, you know, deep prayers of Paul and, uh, you know, deep Pauline prayers in which, you know, if you're looking to learn, you know, how should I pray? What should I pray? How is a believer to pray today? You can read Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 19, learn more about how it is we're supposed to pray. You can also go into Colossians chapter one and you can see the same thing as well. And uh, you, know, you could read verses 9 through, uh, I'd say, 11. And see, you know, another example of Pauline prayer, how is it that we're supposed to pray? And so you get examples of Pauline prayer in the dispensation of grace in regards to the revelation of the mystery. So we see just examples there. But as we bring it back to the dimensions of the mystery that we're going over today, Paul's prayer that we're reading about today, and the book of Ephesians that we're going through today, just these couple of chapters, or these couple of verses in chapter 3, 
Uh, we see in verse uh, 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And so we're going now into wow. verse 16. And so he's saying this here, he's saying that he would grant you, and of course we have to go back and remember the audience that he's talking to here. So he says they would grant you, and of course, of course that's the body of Christ, but if you look at the, the exact audience, of course, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, to whom the entire letter is written, uh, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, and grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so as he's writing this, as he's uh, writing this prayer to them, he's writing them already understanding that they understand deep doctrine. They understand uh, what the Lord is doing in the dispensation of grace. They already are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've gotten past, uh, well, as we've we did a study on in previous weeks about the milk and the meat. These are already meat eaters in doctrinal understanding. They're, they're not just on milk. Oh, not the uh, group in First Corinthians, they're the Ephesians who are digging into the meat a little better. And so he's saying this in verse 16, that he would grant you, you know, strong, you know, meat eaters and other, uh, according to the riches of his glory, which we know that's one of the aspects of, the revelation of the mystery, that when we understand the body of data that God gave to Paul, one of the many things is that in the revelation of the mystery, there are riches. In the revelation of the mystery, there are riches that God has given, uh, made known uh, to Paul, and Paul, and now to us through his epistle, that there are riches uh, in uh, understanding, you know, heavenly rich, heavenly blessings, heavenly riches, heavenly, um, you know, the riches of his glory, and uh, we're going to go through a little bit of that. And he says that the riches of his glory are a part of the mystery made known to Paul, you know, such as uh, what we're going to go through, you know, being strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We'll go through that. But uh, we see there, according to the riches of his glory, is a phrase that we see as Paul starts out more what he wants the Ephesians to, to have in regards to their prayer, that he would grant you according to something, and that's the riches of his glory. So according to the riches of his glory, if you look even more at Ephesians 1.18, he says it again uh, with more detail in it in Ephesians 1.18. And he tells them, again, the, the Ephesians, he says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of, of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So now it's the riches of uh, the glory of his inheritance. It's all about the inheritance that we never earned, but was freely given upon trust in the gospel uh, in the saints. And then verse 19 goes on a little more in Ephesians chapter 1. But we see more about those riches of his glory, uh, that kind of concept being mentioned. Even if we look at Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Again, talking about the mystery, just as the Apostle Paul's talking about the mystery to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3, he's also talking about the mystery to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1. And he says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So again, more mentioning of the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is also about the inheritance, which we come back to in verse 16, that he would grant you, you know, Ephesians, according to the riches of his glory. That's a part of the revelation of the mystery. To think that you know, Christ died on the cross, you know, is there anything to that? Uh, one of the parts we learn through Paul's epistles is, yeah, there's great riches for the believer. Uh, not that, that we've earned any riches, but it was freely given to us positionally, uh, spiritually. And when we get to heaven, literally, they're there waiting for us. If we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, for example, positionally, we see this is part of our riches here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, 
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, uh, that in the ages to come he may show us the exceeding, there it is again, riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So we see there that through nothing we've done, nothing we, we didn't work our way to heaven, we didn't earn our seed up there, Christ freely gave it to us as a result of us trusting his gospel and understanding we're the sinner for whom Christ died. And so Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is a full payment for the penalty of our sins. And hath raised us up together, that's again reading verse 6, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ based on uh, according to the riches of his glory, which is what we're reading here in Ephesians 3, uh, verse 16. But again, we're just starting at the beginning of where we're looking to get into concerning the dimensions of the mystery. We're still working our way there. We're seeing here, he says, we're backing up and reading back into it. Uh, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So according to all those riches, in other words, <clears throat> we're seeing that uh, you know we have those spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3, and uh, we have these riches, Ephesians 2, 6. He says, uh, on top of these things, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So we see this here as well. And that's number one. We're seeing four things that this Pauline prayer, uh, Paul prays that the Ephesians would have. This is number one. Number one is to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. This is what Paul prays the Ephesians would have. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Again, this is more for the believer today as being part of the mystery of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For which cause we faint not, uh, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding uh, and eternal weight of glory. But we're seeing that in verse 16. Though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. And it's renewed by 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And so we see that uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, turn to it. But we know that that's our our mantra verse, so to speak. And we study to show ourselves approved. And as we study, the word works effectually in us. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 13. If we look there for a moment. That's where we're going to get our inner man renewed with his uh, Holy Spirit-inspired words. That's 2nd, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians uh, 2, 13. Where Paul says, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So we have to, when we study the word, we hear it, and we we hear what we hear, or see what we see as we study it. We believe this to be the actual word of God, not just the word of men. It's not just the word of men, but it's the actual word of God. We believe it, we study it. And it works effectually in our inner man. As our outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. You can see a little bit more about that in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 as well. As we we conform less and less and less to this world, our inner man is renewed more and more and more. Our mind is refreshed more and more. So, again, we're seeing more about being strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. More of uh, what Paul is desiring when he talks about the riches. You know, according to these riches... Uh, based on what we know positionally, spiritually, literally, uh, we're to be renewed, we're to be restored, we're to be um, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's number one in his Pauline prayer. And so then he also goes through and he says, verse 17, as we continue through, he says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, uh, that ye being uh, rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth uh, breadth and length and depth and height. But we're going back into verse 17, and he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Again, the four, there are four things in this Pauline prayer that Paul prays that the Ephesians might have. Uh, we saw that to be strengthened with might uh, by his spirit in the inner man was the first one. Verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's number two. So now we're seeing that in Paul's prayers, he prays. 
He's not praying the Ephesians get a new car, they get a new job, they get you know more health and wealth and money and prosperity uh, financially or anything like that. He's actually saying that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So that's one of the things Paul prays for in the dispensation of grace. And as he does this, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 16, it's because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost in this dispensation that God would dwell you know, in us at all. And we see for the, the argument made here in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, uh, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye all are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'm talking about, you know, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of God in this dispensation body of Christ is his agency. So that's why, if anything, it would be that Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith. One, just one reason. If you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, Galatians 2, 20, the Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So 2.20 is a great cross-reference for where we are in Ephesians 3. But he's saying, you know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. He's saying, yet not ever Christ liveth in me. It's, it's Christ that lives in me. And because we're the temple of the Holy Ghost from 2 Corinthians 6, Christ liveth in me. And you can also remember that verse from uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so we're seeing this here uh, in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we see this, uh, you know, the faith, the doctrines of the Son of God uh, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're seeing more here that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Uh, the example there, and then I'll give out another cross-reference. We won't turn to it necessarily just now, but Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11 it's another good cross-reference. You can uh, read and uh, cross-refer that as well. But we're seeing that that's number two. Paul's giving, again, four things in this, in this prayer that he wants the Ephesians to have. And again, number one was to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. But, and number two, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And of course, now we're going to get to the third part. And the third part is where you start breaking it down into four, you know, uh, we're going to break the third part down into doctrines, you know, uh, com comparing spiritual things with spiritual, first, from 1 Corinthians 1, uh, learning learning the material, learning the doctrines, being rooted and built up in Christ, again, according to the revelation of the mystery, if we're not learning and rightly dividing uh, what Christ is doing in the different dispensations, uh, understand that Christ himself never changes, God himself never changes. Uh, we're not root, being rooted and built up in it. We're just staying in the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, never getting out of them, never going beyond that. Uh, we're not being rooted and built up in them. We're just kind of stuck in the red letters, trying to figure out what did the red letters mean. And most most proclaimed Christians are just kind of stuck there and never really getting out of that section, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But to not just study that, then go beyond that, get to Paul's epistles, and rightly divide the entire Bible to see where God is and what he's doing and to whom he's doing everything with, you know, in all 66 books. Now you're seeing the entire big picture, which is what is supposed to be uh, rooted and built up in him. That's the third thing. So as this takes place, uh, we're going to see that may be able to comprehend with all saints, you know, what is, and then we're getting into the dimensions of the mystery here. So he says here, uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now, as, as he says this, uh, a lot of people read this and they say, well, this must be the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of God. And uh, verse 19 says, the first verse says, and to know, <clears throat> excuse me, and to know the love of God. So that's 
other thing. That's a separate other thing in Paul's prayer. So when you see this here in verse 18, it says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. It goes back to what Paul was talking about in the first place, which wasn't necessarily uh, the love of Christ, which is what you read about in verse 19. But if you look at uh, Ephesians 3, verse 1, he's talking about you know, the dispensation of grace and the revelation of the mystery, which is what he's explaining throughout that entire chapter. He says in verse uh, 1, uh, Ephesians 3, 1, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he may know unto me the mystery. Here he's talking about the dispensation of grace. He's talking about the mystery. Uh, where he go? He um, held that by revelation. He may know unto me the mystery, as I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And then he goes on explaining more about what that is briefly, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And he goes on explaining you know, that briefly. But he, and he keeps going until we get to where we are in verse 14, where we are now, his prayer and what we're reading about as we get to verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height concerning uh, the, the, the mystery, the mystery of Christ, where we are now. And this is what we're going into. So we're seeing, number one, again, just to kind of recap, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Number two, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Number three, to be rooted and grounded in love uh, and may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, the dimensions of the mystery. And so we're going to go over that now. What are the dimensions of the mystery? What is the breadth and length and depth and height? And so let's go through that now. So we see there, what is the breadth? The breadth is more like a wide range or an extent. You know, looking at the definition of the word breadth, what is breadth? That's you know, a wide range, a wide extent of, of something. And so go through that. So in, in this case, we're going to see how wide is the scope uh, when it comes to the mystery, because that's the subject matter of what we're looking into dimension-wise, of uh, how wide was the mystery between uh, Jew and Gentile uh, beforehand. And of course, Paul, uh, Paul uh, says this, or writes this, based on what God tells him, in, of all things, Ephesians chapter 2. So we go to Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 11. This is the, the breadth, or that wide extent, that wide range between Jew and Gentile that God took care of. And so we're going to see this here. And now how grace is extended to all, and made known unto all, and given freely to all. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 11 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Uh, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh, by the blood of Christ, and there it is. You're sometimes far off, but now you're made nigh. Uh, now that breath, that, that large extent is, is taken care of. That's one of the dimensions there. It says, made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath uh, made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might uh, reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Uh, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. A stone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And then it goes into Ephesians 3, where we are now. So you're seeing just the breadth of the, you know, this one dimension of the mystery. 
goes through half of Ephesians chapter 2. And so that's just the breadth. Uh, when he talks about you know being able to comprehend with all saints, what is the breadth of the mystery? That's the breadth of Ephesians, half of Ephesians 2. So, see it there. But then we get into the length. And when we talk about length, now we're going to go back into Ephesians 1. Because when it talks about what is the length of the mystery, we're talking time length. We're talking you know, how far back do we go? How far forward do we go? And the answer is eternity. Because what we're talking about here is we're going actually before time. And we're talking about a program. This is God's program that was established before the world began. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, which we read a little bit earlier. It says here that according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So when it comes to the dimensions of the mystery, it's speaking of the length, the length of time, the time length. And we're looking at uh, you know, how far back does this go? How far back does this program go where God had set all this up for us? We look here and it says, according to him, has chosen us in him before the foundation of the... So before this earth we're standing on was even created by him, this program was hit. And we see this here. We'll look at some other verses in a minute, but one quick thing I want to cover in verse 4 says, according as he hath chosen us. The Calvinists will read that and say, oh, so we were chosen, but others were sent to go to hell. That confirms John Calvin, but that's not where this verse is going. We see in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him. Well, the program was chosen. The participants weren't. So everyone has the freedom of choice, the free will, to say, yes, I'm going to believe the gospel. Yes, I'm going to uh, trust what the Lord did uh, on my behalf by shedding his blood, and that's a fully sufficient payment for my sins. Or they can say, you know, I don't believe any of that. I'm going to disbelieve the Bible. I'm going to disbelieve what God says. I'm going to disbelieve. They have the freedom of choice to make those uh, uh, decisions. And so when it says, according as he hath chosen us in him, the program was always set up for believers, uh, for this for this uh, dispensation to uh, take place and for the body of Christ to be the agency. The body of Christ is always going to be the agency, no matter if one person or a group of people decides, yes, I want to be part of the body of Christ, or no, I don't want to be the body of Christ. God is still setting up the body of Christ. This is a program still hid from the beginning of the world, now revealed. And we'll look at some other verses now. So what we'll look at is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in uh, verse 7. This program is essentially hidden wisdom, now revealed. And this has been known since before the foundation of the world. This is the time length. And we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So we see there, this was before, this is hidden wisdom before the world. So we see that there. And of course, you know, um, well, actually we'll go there since we're close to it. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. And we see there it says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which we're going over here in Ephesians 3, uh, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And so it's great to see that there, uh, that this was kept secret since the world began. It's been kept secret. It's been, it's been there. It's a program known by God. It's been kept secret since the world began. In other verses, we see it's before the world began. And uh, since the world began, but now is made manifest. So now it's known to everybody. We see that in uh, verse 26, but it was originally kept secret, kept secret in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, kept secret in uh, Hosea and Habakkuk and Nahum and uh, Joel and, and even further back, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Genesis, all kept secret, but then revealed to Paul intentionally and on purpose. And now the participants can freely believe that or freely not, because everybody is, is free to choose. So we see that in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. And if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 
Well, we see it again here. Again, talking about the dimensions of the mystery, we went over the breadth. We're seeing this length of time that you know, God has established dimension-wise concerning the mystery. It says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? That's calling according to the doctrine. That's not calling us based on John Calvin's you know, setup, which is wrong. Uh, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So again, there's that time link explained there. So as we go back to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're seeing that there in verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints. So it's not something that we're just here to secretly know and never tell anybody about. We're to comprehend all this with all saints. The breadth, which we saw in Ephesians 2, the length, the time which we're looking at, not only in Ephesians 1, but 2 Timothy 1, and 1 Corinthians 2, and Romans 16, see that there and now the depth that dimension of the mystery gets explained now where it says the depth is also in ephesians chapter 2. and we'll go into verse 1. so the depth goes through how deep god had to go uh, in order to save us you know what what kind of realm we'll call it and we'll get a little more defined on that in a minute how how deep did god have to go into the say into the dumps to go you know, pull us out. God didn't pull out the, you know, world-class athletes, so to speak, or royalty. He pulled, he pulled us out and got the body of Christ going for him on his behalf. So we see the depth of which God went through uh, to get us, to, to get his agency going. It says, and you hath he quickened, this is Ephesians 2, 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. God went into the concept of trespasses and sins Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So we're seeing the depths through which God went through in order to build up his agency. He didn't go to perfect people with perfect lives and perfect, everything was perfect. He said, I'm going to go to the people who are essentially my enemies. And I'm going to build them up to be my agency. I'm going to go get people who are dead in trespasses and sins. I'm going to go get people who are walking in time past according to the course of this world. I'm going to go get them. And or at least I'm going to have the gospel presented to them and allow them to make the free will choice that they can be a part of my program or not. They're going to be freely offered opportunity to be uh, preachers and, and teachers and soldiers and workmen. And I want them to be my agency, not you know, people who have perfect lives and they're perfect uh, everything is just picture perfect. I'm looking for the people who don't have things going so perfect. And they're walking according to the course of this world. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It says, among whom, which can be also, we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Of course, to teach about God who is rich in mercy, kind of explaining the depth here. Uh, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, uh, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, there's those riches again, uh, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so we see the explanation of the depth that God went through. It would probably be easier to say, um, you know, Peter, Moses, Daniel, uh, I'm just going to change you into the body of Christ rather than you being Israel because you're such good guys. You're such, you know, you got your faults, but, you know, you're already worshiping me. Let's just grab you and bring you over here and let these heathens, you know, die a miserable death. You know, that's not what he did, but he could have done that. But instead, he says, I'm going to those who are dead in trespasses and sins. And we know from Titus, you find the verse, I don't have this on our outline. So if I can find it real quick, but I believe it's uh, Titus 3. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there it is. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Just kind of confirming this again. 
It says, for we ourselves, this is Titus 3, 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. This is who we sometimes you know, used to be. We're sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs of hope, or sorry, uh, made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're seeing there more about the depth of who which God went through. And again, explaining not only the breadth and length and depth of the dimensions of the mysteries, but we got one more. Going back to Ephesians chapter 3, now, I may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. So now we're going to look at the height. Again, that goes into Ephesians chapter 2 again. And we're seeing how this all has to do with that. Uh, when it comes to the height, we're going not past the first heaven, not past the second heaven, but we're going all the way to the heights of the third heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. We read this a little bit earlier, but this is again explaining in detail the height of uh, the mystery. It says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the uh, ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So we're seeing it had raised us up together, there's the height of us in the third heaven, and made us sit together in heavenly places. So we, we're not only raised up there, but we're raised up there to sit up there and be there with him uh, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus which helps us all the more. These dimensions help us all the more with Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Look at Colossians 3, 1. These are some good things when it comes to talking about seek those things which are above. And you always say, well, what are some of the things? And you can probably think about some things that are in heavenly places, and you could, you know, meditate upon it, think about it, you know, imagine what it's like, those type of things where you uh, set your affections on. It says, if ye, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, or Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So you can set your affections on thinking about, you know, what are what are the angels like? What are the archangels like? What are the uh, things that are in heaven that you kind of see in the book of Revelation? You can do that. But also, when you plug in the dimensions of the mystery, the height and length, I'm sorry, the breadth, where we have the breadth and length and depth and height, plug that in. To what you're seeing here, those things which are above, um, set your affection on those things. The height of the mystery, the breadth of the mystery, the length of the mystery, the depth of the mystery. Set your affections on those things, <clears throat> not on things on the earth. And allow your mind uh, to think of those things all day long. And the breadth and the, uh, the you know, your, your meditate, when you, when you think, uh, on those things, and you know, not only just in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, but you, know, you, you allow your affections to be set on those things, how bright a future you're going to have based on those things, uh, the dimensions of the mystery, which is also, you can also think about the mystery of Christ and the aspects that that defines as well. The hard part is, is that, you know, this is such a deep lesson that you find in Ephesians chapter 3, is that most churches don't already start out teaching what is the revelation of the mystery or preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that they could never get into the dimensions of the mystery and then setting your affections on that. They may either be focusing on how great it's going to be to go into an earthly kingdom or how wonderful it is to be a Jew with a covenant or maybe not even that. Maybe a mix of both where they're just confused on who they are and their spiritual identity. But to actually go through and see the breadth and length and depth and height like we just did, we're kind of seeing the dimensions of the mystery and the benefit that, that uh, we have there. So kind of coming back to Ephesians 3, this is what Paul was saying in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what this is. And so that's in order to explain the dimensions of the mystery. First, you may have to go back and explain what is the mystery. Uh, but before you do that, you have to make sure that the saint that you want them to understand all this with is first saved. And then you first have to go with the gospel. So there's a few things that lead up into explaining the dimensions of the mystery. But nonetheless, to enjoy this and to set your affections on this and to meditate upon this and to, to be unified with this is something that has to go with learning what it is in the first place. So, so we see this here, but this is 
to some of what Paul is talking about when he goes over this. So we still, going back again, you know, four things in this Pauline prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians to, to have. It was again to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Then it was that Christ may dwell in their hearts, or you know, the Ephesians' heart, by faith. And of course, as we plug this into our understanding, us too. And three, that they would be rooted and grounded in love, you know, through doctrinal understanding. And this is where he says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. He didn't really say of what, but we know through the chapter it was about the mystery. And we kind of went over that just now. Now we see that we're still on number three. This is, like I said, there's a A and a B. And we're kind of going into that now. We just went through A. That A was maybe able to comprehend all, uh, comprehend with all saints what is one, two, three, four. That's part A of number three. Part B of number three, if we're going to call it that, is going to be and, where he says and, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So he says this here, if we look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. So we see Paul's getting deep. Paul's really explaining himself. And it takes you diving, and diving deeper into what Paul says to see that Paul wants them to know this and this and this and this and have this. And, and we're kind of going off into section A and section B here. But this is how Paul is speaking to them, wanting them, you know, praying to God about the Ephesians. But when he says, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. You see in um, Romans 5.8. He says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Uh, for if well, what, excuse me, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we, sh we shall be saved uh, by his life. And it kind of goes on to talk about we've now received the atonement. But we're seeing all of this about the love of Christ explained in Romans chapter 5. And Romans chapter 5 is a great chapter to go over, you know, again and again and again, uh, if needed, uh, towards those who are you know, new. You can present that to them or towards you know, uh, yourself when you just need you know, kind of a, a reboot on understanding the love of God. We see that in Romans 5. So we see this explained here. And to know the love of Christ, we went through Ephesians uh, 2. If you look at Ephesians 3.8. What God, or what God explained to Paul when Paul writes down to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, uh, that I should preach among the uh, Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so he's saying in verse 7, he's made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. But he's saying that he's, the less, he's less than the least of all saints, and yet the grace is given to him. He said that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so it's a, it's a right thing that uh, in the dispensation of grace, all men can have the opportunity to be saved by trusting the gospel. And Paul says he's, the less, he's less than the least of all saints, and yet grace is given even to him, or more so especially to him. So we see this uh, explained in Ephesians uh, 3.8. So we're seeing that you know, love, you know, God's love is not found in the law today. It's found in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that there, and you, you study out the principles of who God is and what he's doing, and you see that this is where you know, we find that love of Christ. But then, as we went through number one, number two, and all of number three, you know, part A and part B, if we want to call it that just now, now there's finally a number four in Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter three, and he says, uh, let's see, in verse 19, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So he says this here in verse 4, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And there's where he's starting to wrap things up. But this is uh, where we're seeing this in, part four, in uh, the fourth part of what Paul prays for the Ephesians in this prayer. That they would be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, how does that take place? How do you get filled with all the fullness of God? Uh, you can have that with knowledge. You can have that with the Holy Spirit of God himself, with love and with judgment. So we start with, with the concept just of knowledge. If you look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 14. Romans 15 and verse 14. 
And he says here, and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And so he's saying that, you know, he's, he's glad that they're filled with all knowledge. That's a right thing for the believer today, to be filled with all knowledge when it comes to be, uh, being filled with all the fullness of God. It starts, you know, with the idea, at least, with, with the knowledge of God. And then again, you could even bring it back to 2 Timothy 2.15, studying, being filled with the knowledge of God. Uh, and Romans 15, 14. So we see that there. If you look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul also said this as well. Philippians chapter 3 and uh, verse 10. And this is some more knowledge that Paul wanted to have as well. He said that I might know him. And again, not, not about the law and how it works and how could he gain righteousness, which you can't by the law. But how can I know, you know, what is it, uh, who is it, or what is it that I want to get knowledge of? He says that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable uh, unto his death. So he writes this as well. So, you know, when it says uh, that you might be filled with the fullness of God, it's going to come to uh, uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 14, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, as Paul himself said it as well. You can also look at Ephesians, again, going back to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 18. Not only being filled with knowledge, you see also in Ephesians 5, 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You see that there, and again, another example, just as we kind of gone over with quite a bit, being filled with the Spirit is, you've got a whole book here with the Holy Spirit-inspired words of God. You want to be filled with that as you study it, read it, learn it, grow from it, and understand it. Uh, it's a life of nonstop studying, uh, but you want to fill yourself with it and allow your inner man to be edified by it. And so we see that there. And then Philippians chapter uh, 1 in verse 9. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 goes over the last two things we were talking about. Because what we're reading here, this is that you might be filled with all the uh, fullness of God. And so far we've seen it's going to be about knowledge. Then it's also going to be about being filled with the Spirit. And then we're also seeing it's going to be about love and judgment. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 says, And this I pray, so we get another prayer from uh, Paul here, not only in Colossians 1, not only in Ephesians 3, but also in Philippians 1. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So we're seeing him talk here that uh, your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Knowledge and judgment. Those are things usually that people say, well, you're not supposed to judge and you're not supposed to, you know, whatever it may be concerning the concept of judgment. But we're seeing knowledge was already something we saw in Romans chapter 15, verse 14, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Knowledge of God, knowledge of his sufferings, knowledge of who he is, knowledge of what he's doing. Most churches don't do that. Uh, or they try to and they get it wrong. But we're seeing you know, knowledge and in all judgment. So when it comes to judgment, you should be discerning. You should have judgments about things that are right and things that are wrong, things that are good and things that are bad, things that are godly and holy, and things that are unholy and things that are wrong. And so you do make judgments, uh, multiple judgments, the more the better, so that you can be discerning and, and uh, have opportunity to say that what this is is a good thing and a right thing, and what that is is a bad thing, and we're not going to go forth with that, and we're not going to do this because it's not according to who God is and what his plan is. And in order to know that, you have to be able to study God's word, rightly divided from a King James Bible, and know that to be true. So we see this here when it comes to being filled with all the knowledge of God. So those are the four things that Paul prays for in this prayer that he wants the Ephesians to have you know, involving the dimensions of the mystery, involving all this. So this is you know, a, a great prayer to go through in, in Ephesians chapter 3. And like we said, Philippians 1 has another, if you're looking to know more about prayer, just as a side issue in this one topical study, Philippians 1 has a prayer Colossians 1 has a prayer. Um, you see it also in Ephesians 3 that there's Pauline prayer, uh, examples given on how the believer is to pray today in the dispensation of grace according to the revelation of the mystery. We see that here, but in that prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, so I kind of turn back to it myself, 
we see what are the uh, dimensions of the mystery. And that we're to comprehend with all saints what that is, uh, the uh, breadth and length and depth and height. And so that's a right thing that we know this and that we pass this on to, you know, saints as we you know, see them as well. So this was just meant for the Ephesians, that prayer was meant for the Ephesians, but in the body of Christ in general as well. So, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll stop here a little bit early and uh, see if there's any kind of thoughts or comments on this study, the dimensions of the mystery based on Paul's prayer and the four things that he wanted them to have in this prayer. And uh, we'll see if there's any kind of uh, thoughts or comments on that. We can wrap up here. I do have a question about verse 18. May you be able to comprehend <clears throat> with all saints what is the breadth, depth, length, and uh, breadth, and length, and depth, and height. Now, you said that's about the mystery. Is that not also about the vastness of God's intent? Yeah, which would be what the mystery is <clears throat> his intentions or his purposes in this day and age today. His, his, to, his, <laughs> Okay, so it's okay. So the mystery is about the best, essentially. It today is, yeah. If you went back in time, you'd see it'd be about the law and prophecy. You know, that would be his intent back then. Back then. then. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, you're essentially saying it right. You're just you're kind of saying you're in a different wording for. Yeah. Okay. I have a question, Philippians 1.10, where it says that he may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Uh, without offense, is that that I don't offend who I'm speaking to or with, or is that they don't, their comments to me won't offend me? Well, it's not that you can't be without offense, because when you first, if you could try, it's just, it's, Let's see, it says that you may approve things that are excellent, and that comes with judgment. It says that you may be sincere, and that's going to be with uh, you know, judgment as well, and without offense. Because I guess you're, you're going to judge what you say to people based on who they are. You're not going to, uh, if you want to reach somebody, you know, for Christ, evangelism, you're out there talking to people, and you know they're Catholic, you know, they just, they, you talk enough to them, you're not going to try and intentionally, first thing off the bat, slam the Pope or whatever. You'll get to that eventually. You'll get to explain, you know, the Pope's a scam artist and everything that they're doing is wrong and bad. And it's just, you know, you shouldn't even be there in the first place. But that's not right off the bat. That's not the first. You're going to offend them right off the bat. So you'll get to that. I mean, it's it's right to say that. It's not a wrong thing. Uh, but you want to get to that. There's a time and place. There's a time and place for saying exactly that. You may want to sort of get, you know, talking to them first about the truth of the gospel, the mystery God's plans and purpose, maybe, you know, interact with them, you know, however the situation presents itself. Uh, just not right off the bat, oh, hey, I'm a Christian and, and your Pope's a terrible guy. Uh, they'll just be like, well, then I don't even want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to even hear what you have to say. You've offended me. Yes. Okay. You know, but uh, at some point, if you talk with them for six months, six years, 10 years, at some point you say, look, your Pope uh, does nothing for me. You know, and then they'll be like, well, I've talked to you long enough to know that that is your position, and I know. Um, and they, they, it doesn't shock them when you say that. Uh, but at, at some point, you do have to bring these things up. It's just you're going to discern. You're going to use that judgment to discern when the right time is to do that. You're not going to not tell them that, but you are going to use the right time to tell them that. Mm -hmm. You don't want everybody to walk away from you to where you can never speak to anybody. And at the same time, you do want to present truth at the same time. Because yeah, um, I'm trying to think of that verse that uh, uh, so the servant of the Lord. With salt. Yeah, season with salt. That's a good verse too. But there's also one that says that the servant of the Lord doesn't strive. So oh, yeah. you're not going to strive with everybody because all you don't want your ministry to have to be nothing but striving with everybody you see. But you do want to make sure that you stick to the truth, and you do want to make sure that you're you're not everything's a fight. Everything doesn't have to be a fight. Everything shouldn't be a fight. And there's some there's some people on the wrong side of doctrine that will stick to their guns no matter what you say anyway. So allow you're going to have to allow them to go. You're going to try to plant the seed and allow them to go be on their way. And then the next person will come down and plant the seed. And, and you're going to pray for them and you're going to do everything. But, you know, everything doesn't. Now, some things can, can be a fight. 
it just depends on what the situation is, but your whole ministry life isn't meant to be a constant, nonstop battle with people. Battle with people. But it can be with some. Yeah, it's just you're going to be battling sometimes. Sometimes it seems to, like it. Yeah. To defend what you... Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, not gonna, yeah. You're, not, you're not going to let go of what you believe. You're, no, there's going to be battles. There's going to be fights. There's going to be battles. There's going to be people you offend, and you're not even going to try to offend them. So you're going to say, so as it says, you know, without offense, you're going to be sincere without offense. You're going to give it your best shot. But no matter, I mean, you, you kind of see the culture in the world we're into, you say the littlest thing and they're offended by that. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, while you try to do it, you don't want to, you don't want to fall back so much that you don't even tell them any truth any time, any day. You're still going to tell them, well, here's, here's the truth. I'm, I'm trying to water it down as much as I can. And you can't even handle that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not giving up what I believe on either. So don't use chick tracks. <laughs> well, chick tracks aren't right anyway. Yeah. Well, no, I know. But I'm, I remember that thing where isn't he the, the teacher that says, you know, uh, if you stole a pen from work, you're thinking. He, he was, no, he was, that was Ray Comfort. He's using, oh, okay, he's, okay. Using, he's using the law correctly. He actually got that point right. Oh, yeah. Was, but, but it's still, it's offensive initially, you know, the saying, well, you're, you're a thief. Well, I mean, that's well, that doesn't offend me. That that gets you. Well, thinking. but that's supposed to get you. No, thinking. I know it's supposed to get you thinking. But uh, to your point about what things are like, well, to it if you start off with that, I mean, you know, I mean, who wants to listen anymore? Well, that's what the law does. The law is supposed to. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't think we're wonderful, and you just called me a thief and a liar. But that's supposed to get you thinking. That's, I, I understand. That's what society is. But you just said our culture is such that people get offended if you look at them. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I, and I was just kind of kidding anyway yeah. with that. But. So you don't want to give up. You don't want to give up your guns either. Right. But you want to also stick to what you believe. So you're finding that balance. You're finding that line. You know, of what works. And what works with one person doesn't work with the other. And you're you're out there finding it out. You know, and you're testing the waters day by day. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you said this, though, I also took it the other way that, regardless of what. After I make my presentation, regardless of how they react to me and what I said, that I should not take offense. Oh yeah, yeah. You'll you'll find that out when you go out there and you. Oh, I know. I I, I mean, I, people look at me like I got three heads sometimes. So yeah. So that was kind of like, well, don't get offended by that because that's what you can almost expect. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. But yeah, those are good questions there. So, yeah, any other uh, any other thoughts or questions based on uh, you know, the dimensions of the mystery or anything we just went over for today? So, yeah, we might wrap up a little bit early, and then uh, yeah, we'll be back here on uh, Wednesday for our, another study, and uh, we'll also have the chat room open in case anyone's got any questions or any kind of thoughts or comments they want to include on that. And the keywords for Jim. Yeah, yeah, we'll have that as well. Well, don't, that don't forget the gospel. Yeah, yeah, gospel as well. So we'll do that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll kind of wrap up here. If there's no other comments, and we'll kind of you know, be back here on Wednesday for another study. All right, so, so we'll do that. And we'll, uh, well, yeah, we'll be back here in a couple of days. <laughs> see you all Bye, Wednesday. Yeah, we'll see everyone later. <laughs>